Hi everyone and welcome to this Chatham House event on Brexit what to watch. I could call it Brexit, is it really still going I suppose, but we've got a lot to talk through. We've got a fantastic panel to do that. Uh, Georgina Wright from the Institute for Government, Anna Isaac from Politico, uh, Richard Whitman who's an Associate Fellow at Chatham House and also of the University of Kent and Vernon Bogdanor who's a Research Professor at King's College London. Talking of which, I'm Arnon Menon also from King's College London and the way we're going to proceed is we're going to sort of have a discussion as a panel I'll try and talk to each of the panelists a little bit to start with after which we'll welcome your questions I should say that this is being recorded uh, you are being uh, it's on the record you're encouraged to tweet if you want to do that sort of thing using the hashtag ch events uh, and when it comes to questions from the audience, if you can submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom, we're then hoping rather heroically that we can get people on mic to actually ask their question when I call on them. If for any reason you don't want to speak or can't speak, add that to your question and I'll try and integrate your question into our conversation so that it gets asked but do please start sending your questions in early because if I can filter some into our conversations I will so we can cover uh, as many of them as possible. I think that's everything I've almost certainly forgotten something but we'll see what happens if we go from here. So Georgie I'm going to start with you with the easy question what's going to happen? Thank you so much Arnon and thank you Chatham House for the invitation to be with you um, this lunchtime. Well, uh, what's going to happen? No one really knows, to be honest. 21 days uh, to go until the end of the transition period, uh, where we know that deal or no deal on the 1st of January, the UK and EU will be trading on radically different terms. So where are we? Well, we're still at it. 98% <laughs> of the uh, text, according to reports, has been negotiated and agreed to. We know that the Prime Minister went to Brussels on Wednesday, met with the Commission President to hold face-to-face -face talks. They decided that their negotiators should have a final go and they set Sunday as a potential deadline. Um, we don't know whether these uh, talks are going to lead to a breakthrough or a breakdown. Um, again, we apparently Sunday is the day where we will find out, but uh, as with much of Brexit, um, that could shift as well. Um, we know that the EU leaders also met in Brussels on Thursday and today for their call to the European Council, where according to reports, they spoke eight minutes about Brexit. Um, so lots of other things that they needed to discuss. And we know at the same time that the Prime Minister obviously came out last night and said there was a very, very strong possibility that the UK and the EU would fail to reach a trade agreement by the end of the year. So the mood music is, is a bit pessimistic. Um, but on a more positive note, we know that there was a breakthrough in the Joint Committee, which is um, the UK EU forum responsible for overseeing the application of the withdrawal agreement, which was of course passed in January. And there have been lots of decisions there made um, that will impact Northern Ireland and particularly trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which I'm sure Anna has um, views on that and we can come back to later. So there has been some kind of positive news on the Brexit front this week. Will we have a deal? Um, Look, if we are to have a deal, it will be the result of compromise where both sides are going to have to move and give in. The key question really is, is it a deal that both sides see as a price worth paying? Um, at the moment, you're hearing that actually they, they don't think that what's on the table can, can is, is OK. Um, and that we know that in any case, there will be disruption. So I think for the prime minister in particular, and I know this is something you said before, in a deal scenario, the Prime Minister has to own that disruption. In a no-deal scenario, he could potentially blame the EU. So it's not just about the deal on the table, it's also about whether you can sell it politically and what it will do to your own domestic audiences. So there's a lot in play. Everything really now uh, lies on what happens over the next couple of days, and we shall see. And it's worth that regular reminder, isn't it, that you know other people have domestic audiences too. And so it's not, I think in this country, we tend to think that we've got political constraints and everyone else is being stubborn, whereas uh, in actual fact, we've all got them. So, Anna, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's been a lot of talk about this being a thin deal that's being negotiated, though it sounds quite a long thin deal. Uh, is, is there a massive difference, economically speaking, or for businesses between deal or no deal at this point? Um, it's very difficult to answer that question and I think as we get crunchier and crunchier with the economics forecasts of, of addressing that very question, 
we're seeing how very difficult it is for people to puzzle it out. Now that's not because of the tariffs, because you can model tariffs into an economic mm. forecast quite easily. It's because of the non-tariff barriers. So those barriers that we're going to have deal or no, what's the actual impact of slowing goods at a border because they have to fill out a form as much as whether or not they have to pay a fee. Paying a fee or tax as the tariff is might determine whether or not the goods get to the border in the first place, but they don't tell you how reluctant businesses will be to try and deal with the extra headaches involved. It's also that we don't necessarily know what a lot of the non-tariff barriers might look like for services yet. We know some things are probably off the table, like mutual recognition of professional quali qual qualifications, which uh, is fancy talk for if you qualify as an architect in the UK, will you be recognised as an architect in Germany or elsewhere? Um, uh, ditto with being an accountant, et cetera, other areas. So we know that mobility is going to have a big impact, but we don't know how great that will be. We've also lost our counterfactual because of COVID. So we don't know what mobility would have looked like in a normal world. We're all dealing with lockdowns. We don't know what the UK economy would have looked like in a non-pandemic world, which comes back to this point about selling a deal versus no deal. That political implication of not having that clear counterfactual, that clear what would the world have looked like had it been for a different course with Brexit is going to make it easier in some ways to sell whatever deal we have and harder in others. So future prosperity on the one hand versus the current state of play. We won't really, really know what the hit of a no deal would be very immediately. There's also different kinds of no deal. So that's a really big question uh, for businesses. We've seen with, uh, and, and Georgie touched on this, this issue with the, the Northern Ireland command paper. We are starting to get a picture of what no deal might look like from that in that you've got three months, six months and 12 month provisions for different areas. Um, and so that shows a willingness to mitigate some trade disruption but they're very clear, stark deadlines. So it's it's a scramble period, basically. And so what we're likely to see is a scramble period in the event of no deal, rather than necessarily a complete cliff edge. But there are areas where it could be. They're trying to move forward on data adequacy. There would probably be something like a six month provision based on the latest reporting. But that's one of those areas where if we don't get something beyond that six month, we start to see all of these different cliff edges for different sectors of the economy. And that becomes very, very painful. We've also got businesses who will have to scramble to try and deal with whatever rules of origin are contained within a deal to try and get their heads around what, what, what that picture will look like. There are provisions within the Northern Ireland command paper to show us, oh, hang on, this could, uh, this could be baked into a, an FTA. So there are provisions within the command paper that show us what a deal could look like, but they also show us that, that no deal is not necessarily pure disruption, but it's tough. The implication I took from the sort of uh, arrangements on Northern Ireland was if you live there, you should probably start stocking up on Tesco burgers now while they're still available rather than waiting for the end of the mitigations when they might not be. But I mean, one actually, just a quick follow up for you, Anna, which as a political scientist fascinates me is how apparent to your average voter Will the economics of I mean, discount the I don't mean the disruption at ports and stuff early on. I mean, moving forward, do voters think, oh, wow, this isn't good. This must be Brexit. Or is it is it far more subtle and disguised than that in terms of how this feeds through into day to day life? I mean, businesses will feel it, but we'll. I think the average political um, operator, i.e. average voter, has become much more attuned to it. And for one reason, based on all the vox popping I've been trying to do recently, is supermarkets and people stockpiling at supermarkets. It has suddenly made people much, much more alert to the impacts of economic disruption on their everyday life. And also they are much more sensitive to the small price changes in everyday goods. So people are really feeling the pinch. We've got a massive uptick in unemployment that's quite hidden in the official data at the moment because of the job retention scheme. And so all of that sensitivity around small price differentials, supply, getting the things they want at a time when they need comfort, i.e. if they can't get the chocolate they want, things like that, is really starting to hit home because of COVID. So I actually think mm. the political awareness of trade has rocketed in the last year in a way that we right. just didn't have 18 months ago. The abstraction is gone and people want to know how they're going to get by. Interesting, interesting. That changes things a lot, actually. Richard, I can come to you next. I mean, we don't talk about it enough, but I mean, Brexit isn't just about what happens domestically. It's also about Britain's place in the world. And going forward, I suppose, two questions. How does Brexit impact on our foreign and defence policy ambitions? And where do you think the UK is headed as a foreign policy player? Thanks, Anand. And, and uh, I was fascinated to hear what uh, Georgie and Anna said. And, and as you suggest, I was going to pull back a bit and perhaps ask some questions about um, 
about the sort of foreign policy impact. Now, I think we're all aware of the fact that the UK's taken a bit of a hit in terms of, of reputation. I mean, its public diplomacy hasn't been as adroit uh, as it might have been. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, there's been puzzlement, uh, certainly in other European capitals on occasion as to, as to what the UK's, UK is about. But some of the interesting questions to me are, you know, so what happens to the UK uh, after the deal? What kind of a European power does the UK want to be? What are its ambitions within, uh, within Europe? Uh, and, you know, the, the, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee spent some time trying to work out exactly what was, what was Britain's European diplomatic strategy for the future. And they drew a bit of a blank. Uh, uh, and, and I think what we've tended to have in place of that is the sort of platitudinous where we've, we've been told, of course, that the UK uh, is, is leaving the EU, it isn't leaving Europe. And sometimes that's uh, acted as a replacement for a sort of clarity uh, as, to, as to what Britain might want. There are, of course, bigger questions, aren't there, as to what the British model of capitalism might look like, you know, whether the UK will be a more transatlanticist economy, what contribution might Britain make to the European security order? Really, really big questions that have obviously uh, are, are further down the line in terms of the, the UK, uh, where the UK uh, fits. And I think one of the, the things perhaps which has gone a bit under the radar on the Brexit negotiations is that foreign security and defence policy was an area that, that the UK didn't want to negotiate with the EU on. Uh, and you can you can read that in a number of ways, and we produced an expert comment for Chatham House on it. But it means essentially that you know the the, the core, some of the core strengths that the UK has uh, are are not issues that are being worked through with the EU. I think part of that's the EU's fault that their offering was was a fairly pallid one. But I think uh, you know the the broader uh, need uh, for uh, the EU and the UK to sort of connect on a whole range of foreign policy issues, not just the CSDP, CFSP stuff, but environmental uh, security, uh, 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 the kind of issues that we've seen come out to, on Hong Kong, the rights based uh, foreign policy issues, uh, and so on, uh, and so on. All of that is going to have to be uh, going to have to be worked through. Uh, and, and what we've had from the government so far is that the, the government wants to see the UK as being even better friends than was the case uh, previously and better neighbours. But you know, they're, 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 the question is really begged, I think, after this agreement's reached, assuming that it's reached, uh, what does that mean? What does that mean uh, substantively beyond uh, what I think uh, has been uh, the primary uh, focus so far, which has been to press on the security and defense stuff and perhaps to give the impression sometimes that the UK should seek to do, uh, uh, sh should seek to carry on playing Sparta to Brussels, Athens. In other words, you know, focusing on the defense stuff, and that will be the UK's major contribution to the sort of security and diplomacy uh, of Europe. Uh, and to me, this really, you know, is, is a pretty big uh, underexplored issue for the day, the day after the deal. Absolutely. No, I think you're spot on. Vernon, turning to you, last but not least, you may wave your book at this point if you want, Vernon. <laughs> Well worth a read Vernon's book, not least because it provides a, a welcome degree of uh, sort of historical perspective. And what I'd like you to do, Vernon, if you can, if you can do this in a sort of brief way, because it's a long, long story, is reflect on what history can teach us about where we are now and on the basis of that, where we might be headed, if that's not a terribly unfair question. Indeed, I think the best way to start is by looking at the purpose for which the EU came into existence. And it was to secure peace in Europe. It was a peace project. It wasn't fundamentally an economic project, still less a federal project, but a peace project. And it was to secure peace by transcending nationalism through creating a liberal supranational order in Europe. And from that point of view, it may seem that Brexit is an instance of a more general trend in the world of pressures on that liberal order and a weakening of international institutions <clears throat> and a weakening from voters who are sometimes called nationalists, but they're not only nationalists, they tend to be communitarians as well. For example, one of the pressures, one of the reasons for the pressures to restrict immigration was not only connected with the nation because it alters the community and it has social effects on a community on which people were not asked, they did not give their consent to these changes. And these changes are associated with economics and above all culture. 
what are your educational qualifications and where do you live? Now the exam passing classes to which we all belong, we live in cosmopolitan areas, primarily London, which voted remain. And we are more at home in Brussels and in Berlin than we are in Bolton or Bishop Auckland. But 60% of people in Britain live within 20 miles of where they were born. And economics also, what sort of area do you live in and what work do you do? Is your perception one of economic vitality, in which case you'll vote remain, or is it of economic decline, in which case you will vote to leave? And the referendum, interestingly enough, gave proportional weight, which the electoral system doesn't, to the leave voters who many of them live in safe Labour seats and therefore their votes don't count much in general elections. In a referendum, every vote, of course, counts. Interestingly enough, the US Electoral College gives a disproportionate weight to communitarians. So Brexit seems an instance of a more general phenomenon. And the consequence uh, is sometimes seen in very pessimistic terms. In a very otherwise very kindly review of my book, Richard Evans, the Cambridge historian, said that I don't consider that how Brexit has unleashed demons of anger and prejudice in English culture. Well, I don't consider that because I don't believe it to be true. It's very interesting that in March last year, an Ipsos Mori poll showed 48% believing that immigration has had a positive effect on the country, much higher than in any other country in the European Union. Migrants are much less likely to be unemployed in Britain than, for example, in Sweden, in Austria, and in Germany. We return more non-white MEPs than any of the 27 other member states. 19 of the 28 returned none at all. And now it's coming to be the case that ethnic minorities are more likely to be in professional jobs than whites. And the people who are least likely to get into university are white teenagers. Above all, we are the only major state with no populist or racist party within our legislature, unlike, for example, France or Germany or Italy. So Brexit, in my view, shows the tremendous strength of Britain's liberal culture, and that is very important to Europe. So it's not, in fact, an instance of what it seems at first sight of a decline of liberalism in Britain. And from that point of view, Britain is important to Europe, even after Brexit, as a bearer of liberal political culture and important also for the reason that Richard gave, that without Britain, Europe can't defend itself. It's worth pointing out that the EU is one of the only one of the four major powers in the world which cannot defend itself, but relies on an outside power for its defense 75 years after the end of the war. So on both of those uh, issues, on the question of transcending nationalism, of creating a liberal political culture, and in terms of defence, Britain is vital to Europe, and that should be appreciated on both sides of the negotiation, in my opinion. Thank you. It's interesting, isn't it, how, how the debate got so locked into red lines and details that the sort of bigger picture of sort of strategic interdependence kind of got a little bit lost from view. We've had a load of questions in already, and... I'm not gonna ask all of you for an answer to all of them, otherwise we'll be here all week, but uh, there's one here from Ewan Grant that deals particularly with Scotland and whether the outcome of these negotiations will have a bearing on whether we end up with an independent Scotland or not. Is there anyone who wants to speak on this theme amongst the five of you? Look, it's very difficult to obviously say what the how the Brexit outcome will will you know determine the future, what impact it might have on the future of, of the union. Um, but suffice to say, I think you know the on the first of January, the UK and the EU will be trading on radically different terms. But also, the UK will have taken back control of a lot of policies that were set in Brussels, and that. I think poses a really important and valuable question for the UK government, which is how is it going to coordinate all of this policy making with the devolved administrations? How can they be part of the conversation? What does an effective communication uh, look like? How does that policy process work, particularly with devolution and just the mere fact that well, devolved governments will have um, some direct power in, in setting, you know, whether that's sort of in farming or, or other policy areas. So there is a question there. 
And I think from what you're hearing and what you're reading that the devolved um, governments and haven't always felt included in the Brexit process. And um, that was certainly a criticism at the start of the way that Theresa May had led the negotiations in improved slightly towards the end of her uh, prime ministership. And then of course, now we've, we're hearing reports that it's strained again. Although Michael Gove is supposedly very like regularly in contact and, and really thinking constructively about this. So again, I think the question isn't just about the future of the union as an entity, but very much the future of how it can function. Um, and if we are going to be ambitious with new agricultural policy, new farming policy, whatever it might be, then we need to think very creatively about how we can have a, a kind of you know countrywide approach as much as sort of regional um, differences. Can, can I make Point I want you to come in because Robert Cooper said I've got to ask you this question. Well, it does seem a bit odd if you can't form a relationship with your closest neighbour, then to want to form close relationships with 27 other uh, countries, uh, many of which are far away. It's like a man who wants to divorce his wife after a very long marriage and says that he wants to seek partnerships or relationships with 27 other women some of whom he doesn't know, who live very far away in Latvia, Estonia, Poland, and the rest. I mean, if, you don't, if you're not prepared to share power with your nearest neighbor where you're represented in the legislature, it is very peculiar to want to share power with 27 other countries. And of course, this is a comparatively new position for Scottish nationalists because in 1975, the SNP was the only party in Scotland which advocated leaving the European Union and people were very worried uh, that the reverse would happen to what happened in 2016, namely that there'd be a UK majority for staying in but a Scottish majority for leaving. At some time the SNP changed its policy and I've never seen a good explanation of what reason there was for that change. Isn't the explanation asymmetrical devolution, Vernon, which is to say that the, the, the belief that in the European small states are disproportionately well represented inside the European Union. Uh, the Scots feel disproportionately sort of left out and bullied and the, the Brexit process hasn't helped when it comes to the United Kingdom. Uh, and actually, isn't that one of the reasons that I, I mean, apart from the sort of the nationalist angle to this, there's a there's a frustration at the lack of influence that they have over what goes on because our, our, our system is so asymmetrical. Scotland has the best of both worlds because it has control over all domestic policies, health, uh, education, transport, and after Brexit, agriculture and fisheries, broadly speaking. Uh, foreign policy and economic policy are with Westminster. Scotland now has, in effect, almost total powers over income tax. Um, but it's true that Brexit has altered the situation and that uh, there's a feeling that it's been pushed out of the European Union against its wishes. That, that's certainly the case, but it's got a very good deal indeed out of devolution, uh, very wide powers, and um, th there can't be, I think, any complaint about its domestic uh, policies. There might be complaints about macroeconomic policy and about foreign and defence policy, but you can't argue that an independent Scotland would have greater weight in those areas as part of the United Kingdom. Small countries don't have much of a say in EU economic policy or foreign and defence policy. As we speak, Chatham House is scheduling that debate between Vernon and Ian Blackford for spring of next year, which will be a treat to watch. Uh, Anna, you spoke, you spoke earlier about different sorts of no deal. And in that context, and I'm not sure this will work technologically, but John Peters, a question that I want to go to you first, because it's about what happens after no deal. But John, I'm hoping someone is going to allow you to speak. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Um, and I'm enjoying this. Um, I wanted to ask the question about if it's no deal, um, could negotiations quite, could we get back to the negotiating table quite quickly? Or is it more likely that no deal turns into an acrimonious and near permanent state? Very quickly, in terms of um, the business impact would be so aggressively bad that if you're thinking about it from sort of selling it um, in terms of business government's relationship with business it would be very hard to have a, a cliff edge type moment where you don't even get some kind of trade continuity agreed and then very rapidly say we're going to get back around the table because you'd need to say we had a big falling out they were super unreasonable we couldn't do it so we're going to chuck a bunch of money at you furlough on crack as it were to try and get you through this difficult time 
Um, so you, I think to then wind down and then get back around the table immediately, I would find that very hard to believe. You'd also have effectively sort of torn up some of that alignment um, in a way because, because there would be very big movements, I would have thought in areas like state aid. So you'd have to then get around the table and, and think of it much more like a negotiating a more standard FTA. Um, and that would take years, um, most likely. So yeah, that, that would be my start for 10 on that one. I do hope someone's tweeted furlough on crack. If they haven't, could someone do it? <laughs> Georgie? I mean, John and I have already spoken about this before. I think um, I completely agree with, with Anna. And I think on, on the EU side, although I don't think this is a view shared in Brussels, but it's certainly in EU capitals, there is um, some people think that, oh, actually, if there's an, a no deal, it will be so painful that the UK will be rushing back to the negotiating table. I think Brussels know that's not the case. Um, and I think slowly that message is, is going around as well. Um, you know, and I think it's going to have to take a while for before both sides are ready to come back to the, I mean, they've been at it for four years, nonstop. And, you know, if you're talking about a new uh, FTA, it, you can't really pick up where you left off. You know, for the EU, they need a new mandate. And some member states might be even more intransigent, might have, you know, have more red lines that they want to include in this. So there's no guarantee, actually, that if we have a no deal and that negotiations pick up, that they will be any easier, that you would be deferring the problems, not getting rid of them completely. Um, so I think we might not see both sides coming back to the negotiating table quickly. And I think that those, if they do, the negotiations won't be easy either. So more Brexit to come, if that's the case. And of course, ultimately, I just find it inconceivable that the EU shifts its position. So. <laughs> So, you know, it, politically, that's going to be tricky. We've got a, 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 a question close to my heart, this one, from Michael Harvey, who wants me to ask it on his behalf about Australian terms. Uh, is there such a thing as Australian terms? Is government, heaven forbid, being disingenuous in describing this as Australian terms? Does anyone want to? I'm, I'm happy to jump in from a from a sheer trade perspective. Yeah. Um, so... Uh... Well, the World Trade Organization, the empire of trade, the backstop for trade standards with international trading partners is ultimately the basis of the Australian EU trading relationship. That's why we're not rolling over a deal with Australia as a result of having had a membership with the EU as we are with other trading partners. We're starting a whole new FTA with them. That's government policy to start a new FTA with them. So you can't say that there was an Australian EU trade deal that was in any meaningful way facilitating trade on the one hand and say that we need to have a new trade deal with Australia because there's no trade deal to roll over on the other. There's a fundamental disjoint there. Another very simple point that's very quick to make is that what is important is that each and every country around the world pretty much has some form of bilateral relationship with the EU that's governed not by a big full fat free trade ag agreement necessarily, but lots of little bilateral deals. There are some bilateral deals that Australia has with the EU that do ease, do reduce some trade friction, some movement of persons, et cetera. So it would, I'd put it in the grounds of some, some orderly no deal mechanisms is what might be meant by an Australia style relationship. I think it would be much better to say just without a trade deal, but with some emergency provisions in place. I think that would be fairer or to say an orderly no deal would be more accurate. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to jump in here and do because this this gets on my nerves. I mean, as Anna says, there are agreements between Australia and the EU. There are mutual recognition agreements. There's an agreement on wine. There's agreement on passenger name records. Uh, so it, Australia and the EU have agreements in place that will go far beyond anything we have with them in the event of no deal. And Australia, of course, is in the process of negotiating a trade deal with the European Union because they don't think that the current situation works for them when it comes to trade. It's also worth saying, this is a very profound point, Australia is a very long way away. Their trade is about a sixth in terms of value with the EU of what the UK's is. So the notion that we should model our trading patterns with our nearest and largest trading partner on the basis of those of a country literally on the other side of the world is at least at the minimum, I never thought open to question, but I shall leave it at that before I start getting cross. Fiona Bowler, are you are you able to and willing to speak 
Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose my question is, um, do you think that Boris Johnson will kind of politically survive a no deal Brexit? I know a couple of months ago, there was some talk about um, him becoming kind of the full man if, if a, a deal wasn't done. Um, how likely do you think that is? Vernon, would you like to go first on that? Can he survive a no deal politically? I think the problem is this, that the vision of the Brexiteers, the leaders of the campaign, was that a minimal deal or even a no deal would be perfectly satisfactory because the vision was of a global free trading Britain with very few regulations, tariffs and subsidies, lower taxation to encourage entrepreneurs to come to London or other parts of Britain and invest and so on. And the more you move into that vision, the less you're in need of an EU, relate close EU relationship. It's the vision some people said of Hong Kong or Singapore. It's more like the sort of thing that New Zealand did when we joined the EU or the EEC as it was then in 1973. They adopted those sorts of policies under a Labour government, interestingly, so did Australia. But that vision, whether it was ever acceptable to the British public, most of the, those who voted for Brexit voted for quite the opposite, for more social protection, not less. And whether people wanted, as it were, a fourth term of Margaret Thatcher is very debatable. But whether they wanted it or not, COVID makes that vision quite impossible because COVID involves huge amounts of extra public expenditure, state intervention and so on, probably raising taxes rather than lowering them. And I think that is Boris Johnson's problem, that he's being forced to negotiate something which instinctively in, in his heart, he doesn't really want to do. Whether he can survive a no deal, I suspect he can because the Conservatives will uh, say he stood up for British interests and waved the flag and so on. The real problem will come uh, with the uh, likely disruption that will occur and the popular reaction against it. Mind you, I think there'll be that popular reaction even if we get a deal, because I think much more serious is being outside the EU customs union and the internal market. And that will be the case whether or not we get a deal on Sunday. Though that goes back to Anna's point, doesn't it? As, as, uh, Georgia, I can't remember, my, my old mind is going. I can't remember who said this, but uh, if you have a deal, you own it. If you have disruption and it comes because you've signed a deal, that deal's got your signature at the bottom. Whereas you could plausibly, it was Georgia who said it, argue that no deal has President Macron's signature at the bottom, however misleadingly. Indeed, but uh, people may not make those fine distinctions when they see disruption at the ports, when they see the prices of goods going up, when they see a border in the Irish Sea, they may not make those fine distinctions, they may say, look, we were promised something rather better that hasn't actually come about. So I think the government will be in considerable difficulty uh, and additional difficulty because all the pressures now are towards more state control, greater public expenditure. That is not what Boris originally stood for, not what the Conservatives originally stood for, not what they said would be the outcome of Brexit. So I think there could be considerable disillusionment, but as you imply, Anne, and it's impossible to predict the future. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, for a very long time, um, there was a sense that delivering Brexit was the only real thing that united the Conservative Party. Um, of course, with the pandemic, a lot of MPs' attention has obviously not been on Brexit. Um, mm. In fact, the minister was also uh, understandably distracted, and EU leaders, if you, if you look at the other side. Um, but, you know, we know that Brexit, as you said, deal or no deal will cause a lot of disruption. But I think it's pretty clear that a no deal is likely to hit many of those new seats that Conservatives won in the last election more than, than other seats. And so the Prime Minister really has a PR campaign there on his hands where he's going to have to explain that disruption. He can absolutely blame the EU for it, but there will come a point where people will have lots of questions to which he will need answers to. And more than answers, he will need to be able to deliver and show that he is able to respond to that disruption quickly. And that, to my mind, is as important when we're thinking about the survival of a government than, than, than you know, just the, it, what happens on the 1st of January. I sense from the question box that Robert Cooper is getting increasingly sort of frustrated and annoyed. I don't know, Robert, whether you want to give voice to that on the microphone in the shape of a question. Uh... Oh, why not? <laughs> if the microphone, uh, if the microphone works. Um, uh, I was thinking while you were talking, 
Well, Trump lasted for four years. Um, <clears throat> uh, the pandemic may last for two or three. Um, Brexit looks likely to last for a rather longer period. Um, and I find the way in which we've gone into this um, really pretty sloppy and offhand. Um, the, uh, the way in which the referendum was settled to satisfy some dissidents in the Conservative Party, um, the way in which the referendum was conducted, even the people who voted in the referendum, the whole thing is totally sloppy. Um, and I would say that this represents a massive system failure, constitutional failure. So I'm hoping that my old politics tutor might have something to say. I'm assuming that's you, Vernon. Yes, well, I, I dare to disagree with uh, <laughs> Robert on the question of the referendum. It, it seems to me, although I was in the minority, that if the majority don't want us to stay in the European Union, we shouldn't be in it. But I would agree with Sir Robert to this extent that what has happened since the referendum has been extremely sloppy. Look, we were told there would be uh, no checks or delays on the border. That is clearly mistaken. We were told there was going to be no border on the Irish Sea. That is clearly mistaken. We were told there'd be no involvement of the EU or the European Court of Justice in our affairs. That is also mistaken in relation to Northern Ireland. And uh, I think there's been a sloppiness on the part of the Brexiteers to make their vision clear and to work for it. But then even before COVID, it was going to be extremely difficult, but that was what they sold to the public. The picture of global Britain, that was their idea, but not much has been done to put it forward. And perhaps it was oversold. So the challenges were underestimated. And that the worst thing about politicians in a way is not that they deceive the public, but they deceive themselves as yeah. to the difficulties yeah. involved. I mean, we've got a question from Patrick Terry, which is directed at Vernon. But Richard, I'd like you to have a go at this as well, because it's about perceptions of the UK and the rest of the EU. And what Patrick says, Vernon, is living in Germany, I can assure you that the UK isn't seen as a bastion of liberalism, but a bastion of Trumpism. Uh, are you failing to think through how Europeans really see us? Well, I think the Germans have a problem that the Alternative für Deutschland, which is in some respects a neo-Nazi party, is the official opposition. We don't have any parties like that in the House of Commons, so I don't think we need sermons from other countries about how we are to conduct our affairs. I've been very critical of the government, but uh, we have a very powerful liberal political culture. It's worth remembering in, in France, the alternative, if anything happens to Macron, and I pray it doesn't, could be power for the Front National, for Marine Le Pen, in Sweden, a populist party has prevented a majority government from being formed. In Italy, there's a very strong populist party in Parliament. We don't have any of that. We have a very powerful liberal political culture. And this isn't often appreciated on the continent. I, I think it ought to be appreciated much more. I'm going to go to Anna, Anna in a second, then Richard. But Vernon, I just want to pick it. Isn't that, isn't that what young people call whataboutery? in the sense that all that might be true, I'm not wholly convinced by all of it, but even if all of that is true, the question is, is it really the case that people see us as a bastion of liberalism at the moment, given what has happened in this country over the last four years? I mean, just in terms of people's perception of us, do you think that's true? Well, uh, Brexit is not inherently an illiberal project, the democratic project is the majority of people in the country don't want to be in the European Union. It's true, we have had racism in Britain. It's come mainly from people who are Remainers in the Labour Party, which has been accused by the Equality and Human Rights Commission of institutional racism in the form of anti-Semitism. It's not on the whole the Brexiteers who've been the racists. It's Remainers in the Labour Party on the left. And as I say, I speak as a Remainer myself, but one has to face the facts. That's where the racism has been. Uh, not, I think, primarily amongst the Brexiteers, though I don't agree with them, but I think they are not, as often said, illiberal, and I don't believe either that the UKIP party or the Brexit party were illiberal either. They supported positions I don't agree with, but I don't believe that they are illiberal or fundamentally racist. 
Patrick has come back in the questions, Vernon. I think you can probably, I mean, you have a look for yourself. We might get back to it, but Anna wanted to come in and then I want to turn to Richard, if that's okay. Um, yeah, just, just really briefly to say that um, across European countries, across uh, the UK, I don't think any of us can be sort of complacent about the political status quo, given the economic realities we're facing. Mm. Um, and um, when you're facing a catastrophic recession, um, as we have done this year, but we haven't felt the impact of it yet because we've had huge support for the economy so far, I, I don't think across. I don't think it's very helpful or, or that useful to to try and pick apart the, the the drivers of Brexit in a manner that doesn't reflect the reality that we face now and look at the sort of the the, the economic truths there. I think it's also fair to say that in terms of uh, the um, attitudes towards immigration that might have driven some parts, but no means all, of a Brexit vote or a Remain vote in some instances. They, they were completely across the political spectrum, across from people who thought they might be ultra liberal to extremely um, extremely socially conservative. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how helpful it is to sort of um, see it as um, th this country um, is sharing these values, this country is sharing these values. Um, I think the same forces that you find behind the far right in Italy are there in UK politics. I think we have a different party political system that might make them uh, might make them less apparent in some instances, but the system itself does matter. So I think I think there's just some nuance, some economic nuance, some some realities of, of cross cross party thinking there that we would we want to be sensitive to. And I do think it's really worth emphasising the point that we've had the public health crisis. We haven't even dipped our toe in the economic crisis of COVID as yet. And, you know, if, as some economists say, we end up with two and a half million people unemployed by Easter, I think the nature of politics is going to be very, very different as a result. But, uh, Richard, do you want to come? I mean, you, you, this, is, this, is, this is your area in a way, how we work with other Europeans, what they think about us. Have you noticed a, a shift in how people see us? I think it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that conceptions we may have of ourselves, particularly about our political system, you know, the liberal nature of British society and, uh, and, and our politics. I mean, those simply don't hold now, I think, as visions that are held in other capitals as to, as to the strengths of the UK. I think that part of the, uh, the sort of parliamentary theatre uh, for, for Brexit uh, actually gave the impression that, you know, sort of UK politics was dysfunctional rather than functional but I think also the you know a big problem for the government has been it's it's public diplomacy uh, that this sort of messaging uh, for example the the example given earlier you know on Australia I mean that's obviously picked up in other uh, national capitals uh, and and governments there are as puzzled as uh, others on the panel have been as to why that phraseology would be used and it seemed to be you know, frankly duplicitous or underhand uh, to to suggest that 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 is uh, an alternative, or that would be the alternative to be put in place. So I think uh, if you look at across the board, it's not just in Europe. There is this kind of question mark that comes through in uh, in Washington and other capitals beyond Europe as to sort of what the UK uh, is good for uh, if uh, if it's outside the EU. And by the way, that the the messaging on global Britain uh, and so on is tends to be more gently mocked than seized on uh, as, a, as a sort of message that the UK is, is on the up and is going to have something, something new to offer, even if there are things going on in the background to try and strengthen uh, bilateral relations with third countries. We've got the same <clears throat> question from a couple of people. I'm going to put it to you, Georgie, if that's all right. Uh, you can speculate to your heart's de desire. Uh, will the UK rejoin ever? And if so, when? How soon before we start discussing it, if ever? It is the million dollar question, but um, and I'm going to avoid it by giving a very analytical answer, which is it's not really just a decision for the UK. Um, if the UK wanted to rejoin the EU, um, all other EU member states would have to agree to it. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a change where it would actually require not only the approval in the council, so the grouping of the, the member states, and the European Parliament, but also national parliaments to agree to it. And you can see or imagine some national parliaments perhaps not voting in favour of a UK joining uh, the EU. So that's number one. It's, it's actually quite tricky. The second also big difference is uh, the treaty also requires that any new member uh, joining, um, also joining the Schengen zone and the Euro. Now you could imagine possibly the UK 
uh, with very good public diplomacy outreach and, uh, and selling it as, you know, us joining would benefit the EU as a whole, but we'd like to carve out uh, being part of Schengen and the Euro, but, but equally it's quite difficult to see how the EU 27 would agree to that. So who knows, possibly, um, it's just not a very straightforward process. So, um, so I think it would be wise not to really think about that, but certainly think more constructively about what a, a future relationship between the EU uh, and the UK could look like, uh, the UK being a third country. That is. Lovely, thank you. Uh, we've got a very similar question from Robert Morland and Mike Gapes. Uh, Mike, do you wanna, cause I've got your name in front of me. Are you, do you wanna say what your question is? Are you capable, are you all right to speak? Yes, um, my question is, um, in reality, isn't the logic of international capital movement and integrated supply chains going to mean that any UK company or UK based company which wishes to sell into the European market is going to have to comply with EU standards and or otherwise relocate production and relocate uh, distribution centres to an EU member state. That might be you, Anna, in the first instance, I think, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so very briefly, we, we've sort of touched on or hinted at the uh, what you're sort of referring to, which is, is something akin to sort of uh, in fancy terms, the gravity model of trade. But this idea that, um, you know, if uh, the market on your doorstep is the one that you are most attracted to as a trading partner for for ease of um, for ease of logistics. Um, uh, the point about distribution centers is a bit more complicated and will depend a lot on what a final deal looks like and what the situation is with things like free ports. So I might slightly part the distribution center point that you made, um, but you are absolutely right. And there are studies that have been done um, across economics and um, trade to show that you do tend to get pulled not only to your biggest market, but the standards of your biggest market. So unless there was a very, very rapid shift in UK trade, um, you would expect um, the vast majority of uh, exporting businesses in the UK to, by and large, align themselves with European standards. Now, that could change over many years if we were, um, as, is, as is hoped by the Department for Trade, to join CPTPP and to have a trade deal with the US. You could see that starting to change. And one area where you might see it change quite quickly is something like data depending on the outcome of any deal with the EU on data. But when it comes to goods-based trade, um, I think your assessment is, is correct that you would expect um, to be um, companies that are looking to export to the EU to be led by their standards and for UK policy to an extent to have to accept that. Richard, did you want to... Oh, uh, Richard, sorry. I missed a message from Richard saying he wanted to come in, but it turns out it was on the last question. But go on, Richard, if you want to talk about rejoin, we can come back to the Brussels effect thing in a minute, sorry. Thank you. No, I, I was enjoying the Brussels Brussels effect. Um, but uh, on, on rejoin, I mean, maybe the, the question I was going to put back to, to my colleagues on the on the panel as well is, you know, re, rejoin is probably an unlikely proposition. But but what what would be teed up next for uh, EU UK negotiations, assuming that this deal is done, but also how this fee, feeds into to British politics, you know, what kind of offering uh, would would Labour perhaps uh, uh, see itself uh, wanting to have when it comes to, to policy on, on Europe for the next general election? I mean, I think I'd definitely agree with Georgie's analysis that, that uh, uh, future reaccession is, is a tricky proposition. But, but as this deal is likely to prove a very unsatisfactory one in terms of perhaps what people's expectations were as to what they were going to get with the departure from the EU, uh, where, where people think the, the pressure might be to sort of to upgrade, uh, if you like, uh, and and what that would look like. I mean, I have to say, just personally, I think something gets on the policy agenda when one of the big parties adopts it, and I just can't see Labour at the moment adopting rejoin as a as a policy for for lots of reasons. One, because they don't want to be talking about Brexit. Two, because you run into the freedom of movement issue, and if the if, if the red wall seat really are the electoral target, I'm just not sure it, that's a calculation that makes sense to them. Would we get Margaret Thatcher's rebate if we were to rejoin? I'd hazard a guess that the answer to that is no. Quite. <laughs> Did anyone else want to come in on the Brussels effect? I mean, actually, uh, I don't know if any of you did want to come in on that, but Robert, Robert Morland, did you want to pose your question? Because 
it's it was slightly broader than uh, the one from Mike Gapes, and it's it's an interesting issue. If you want to come in, Robert, now problem. I mean, Robert, Robert was just saying that you know this 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 so called uh, Brussels effect, whereby countries neighbouring the European Union, whether they have to or not, end up adopting EU regulations and standards because the market is so big. Uh, does that mean? I suppose the bottom line here is, and and Robert Cooper's made a comment about this. I mean, is even if we end up taking back control, ultimately, isn't life for the British economy going to be very different? So it's, it's going to be a, something of a mirage because that control is going to be not used by businesses who want to comply with the bigger market on your on their doorstep. Well, um, thanks, Anne. Um, the perils of, of online events. Um, I, I just wanted to say that like, whether we like it or not, um, we're going, you know, negotiations may have ended at the end of this year, deal or no deal, but, but talks will continue and even in a deal scenario. And that's because of the Northern Ireland protocols. So we know that Northern Ireland will have to abide by more EU rules and regulations than the rest of the UK. So that means if the EU updates its rule book, then, you know, certainly it's something that, that, that the government's going to have to pay attention to. Um, secondly, it's not just about trade. There are like many areas that the UK and the EU want to cooperate on, uh, on you know, climate change, security. I mean, the UK is chairing the G7. Next year, some member states are part of that grouping and the climate change of COP26. So the UK will want to try and, if not influence EU climate rules, at least talk to um, the EU about them. Um, and then there might be areas where the UK and EU simply want to improve their, their trade terms. So in a sense, businesses will have to keep an eye out because if they export to the EU market, they will have to comply with those rules. But there are also many other reasons why the UK government uh, would like, to, should try and influence um, EU rules if it can. Actually on that, I don't know, I, I was sort of reluctant to ask such a specific question. So I'll ask it to all of you so that if no one knows, then it's no one's fault. But from Peter Leckie, which is, do, does mutual recognition of professional qualifications apply in the context of Northern Ireland? Um, I can answer that one if, oh, if, if, if you're not keen, um, but it will be a slightly hedged answer. Um, at the moment, um, you have to think of Northern Ireland when it comes to a lot of services provisions and movement of people in terms of the common travel area, um, which is an agreement um, from uh, the 20th century that um, it has existed for a long time, predates the Good Friday Agreement and has allowed for um, the movement of people and for, to an extent, some recognition of professional standards to operate in those areas. It gets a bit more complicated when it touches on EU law. Um, and you saw a bit of that effect where you saw a lot of a lot of lawyers from uh, the UK trying to cross qualify, get recognised by the Irish bar mm. so that they could um, continue to practice EU law. That hasn't quite worked out, um, which is a complexity of its own right. But for other areas like accounting, um, like things where it's in the gift of an Irish um, professional body to recognise the qualification of an EU, op a UK operator, then to an extent, the answer is yes it gets more complicated if you're talking about someone who is operating in Northern Ireland who might have a UK qualification but wants to remotely serve a client in Italy and areas like that. So it isn't straightforward, but it is fair to say to an extent, yes. And that kind of special treatment that um, Northern Ireland has in a, in, a, in a range of different ways for very good reason because of the history there. Um, but a, a lot of it, as it's set out in uh, the command paper, as we've talked about, the problem of putting your name to something, the defining it, I think we are going to increasingly find Scottish politics is going to be influenced by the development of the Northern Irish command paper and that and um, that very much living arrangement with the committee. Um, Scotland is going to be looking very carefully about Northern Ireland having the best of both worlds in some different areas like benefiting from other UK FTAs, as well as benefiting from some tariff free access to the EU market, irrespective of whether or not that product ends up in the south of Ireland or whether or not it goes on to other EU member states. So it's, it's a big question you're asking in that um, in that in lots of different ways. Brilliant. Thank you. That was incredibly thorough. I really want I mean, we're running out of time and not everyone's going to get in, I'm afraid, but I really want to give Andrew Ferran the chance to ask this question and to pose it particularly, I suppose, to Vernon, but to anyone else who wants to come in. If you're there, Andrew. Hey, it's how do you do? Uh, it's, I'm speaking from Australia, actually, it's well after one o'clock in the morning. But I'm very interested in the topic, of course. I think I've demonstrated that. Uh, uh, my question was on the lines of, uh, uh, after 47 years of trying, uh, uh, has, uh, after all this time, hasn't uh, General Charles de Gaulle's view about Britain's compatibility with Europe been demonstrated over and over again? Was General de Gaulle right all along, Vernon? 
uh, yes, he was. <laughs> um, and uh, contrary to what Robert Cooper said, I mean, when anyone doesn't like the result of a referendum, it's like when you lose a legal case, the disappointed litigant always says the judge was unfair or the uh, prosecuting counsel was too good or your defence counsel was no good. But I, I think this is right. But where General de Gaulle was wrong is in thinking that Europe could be an entity in the world without Britain. And he did propose in 1969 a foreign policy directorate of the major powers in Europe, Britain, France, Italy and Germany, outside the EEC framework. And that might be looked at again because the weakness of French policy recently in President Macron has been to see Brexit solely in economic terms as an advantage for French businesses and financial institutions and not in the geopolitical terms which are fundamental for France. So I think Macron's policy is not only against British interests but against French interests. So the Gaullist heritage is, if you like, double-edged. I want to come in for what will be the last word now, I'm afraid, because it's too long. Does anyone else want to comment on General de Gaulle? But listen, we've run out of time now, I'm afraid. Uh, it's two o'clock. I just want to end by thanking Anna, Georgie, Vernon and Richard. I thought that was fascinating as everything to do with Brexit. You sort of think everything's been said, but then you have a discussion and uncover all sorts of other interesting issues. But I thought that was utterly fascinating. We shall wait with interest to see what, if anything, happens over the weekend. And I'm sure we'll all see each other again trying to pick over the bones of either a deal or no deal in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, stay well, everyone. Have a very good Christmas to those of you I'm not going to see beforehand. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>